um, Cantor's lemma says, says the following. Suppose that we have a nest sequence of closed uh, intervals, which are also bounded. So each interval represented by its endpoints. We have a n and b n. And um, of course, in order, the, in order for this to be an interval, then a n must be strictly smaller than b n. We're not considering degenerate intervals where a n uh, may be equal to b n, and then the interval collapses to a single point. Uh, and nested means that they're all contained in each other. So the first interval is the biggest, it contains the second, etc. So we have this chain and of intervals, nested sequence. And in addition, uh, what we assume is that the diameter of each interval, uh, which is also denoted by the absolute value of the interval, is just the length of the interval. It's just the distance between two points. Now, you may ask, why do I use the notion of diameter? Well, because whenever you have a way of measuring distances, you have a way of defining a diameter of a set. Basically, for any set, you can say that its diameter is the maximal distance between any two, uh, maximal possible distance between any two points in the set. Okay. So for the circular diameter is just you take uh, two points that are diametrally um, uh, like um, antipodal, and then the you, you connect them, and basically you have this. Uh, straight line that is connecting them, it is passes through the center uh, of the circle, and this is the diameter, right? It's just twice the radius. Uh, but then for arbitrary sets, the maximal distance between any two points uh, can be said to be the diameter. So in this case, of course, the two points in the set that are farthest apart is B and, a and AN, and this is the length of the interval. So, uh, But we'll remember this, that then this can be used to to be generalized to arbitrary metric spaces. So uh, we assume that the diameter tends to zero. So the length of the intervals tends to zero. So it shrinks. And so what would we expect? Well, of course, we would expect that uh, those intervals, since this is a nested sequence, will eventually will have exactly one point in common. They will intersect at exactly one point. And uh, you may say or think, right, this is the intersection. So they, all the intervals, uh, they have exactly one point in common. They intersect at exactly one point. Well, you may say nothing is surprising here. The, the length of the intervals tends to zero, right? And so what is there to prove here, right? And why do we need uh, uh, completeness here? Uh, because it seems intuitively clear. Well, it's, it's not so obvious because if those intervals were, for example, open, then it could be the case that the intersection is empty. So, um, so this is important. So everything here is important. It's important that interval the, the intervals are, are closed, and that they are bounded. And then that we have this um, nested sequence. Okay. So and we will see we will see the proof um, shortly. So actually, let let us see a small uh, visualization of how this nested sequence of intervals looks like. Okay, so let's see how visually this sequence of nested, nested intervals, how it can look like in, in particular examples. So this would be the first interval, I1, from 0 to 1. Then we would take the second interval to be uh, this interval. Um, and then the other. It's just one, but there are infinitely many possible such examples, but I'm showing how it looks like. So we have the first interval, and then the second is included in the first, is contained, etc. And it is important that their lengths tends to zero. Basically, what I do here is a trick that we're going to use when we're going to prove the Heine-Borel theorem, where we actually uh, bisect each interval and we take the half. Um, so the next interval uh, is exactly one half of the previous interval, so its length is going to be one half. And as a result, uh, in this case, it is obvious that the lengths are going to tend to zero because we bisect each time and we divide by two, and one over two to the power of n tends to zero uh, quite rapidly, right? And so we may add more intervals, right? And as a result, if we were to zoom in, we see that the intervals are shrinking, and of course they are going to have some point in common uh, because they're uh, contained uh, in one another. And essentially, what we're saying is that since their length is shrinking, it's supposed eventually to collapse. It will have exactly one point in common. This is the essence of Cantor's lemma. But it is important that the interval, intervals that we're taking here are closed, okay? uh, and, and that they are bounded. And we'll see how it is related to compactness. Now, what we're going to prove, the way that we're going to prove Cantor's lemma is actually uh, by proving an equivalent formulation. So what we can actually do 
is we can look at the endpoints of the intervals. So if we were to look at the endpoints of the intervals, so I would plot the sequence A here. Basically, what we see here is that um, the sequence, the orange sequence that I plotted, is the uh, le the endpoints of the left the left endpoint of each interval. We see that we have this sequence, and we see that it has to be monotonically increasing just from the condition that the intervals must be contained in one another. And then we have another sequence. It is the right edge of the intervals, right? So we have this sequence. And now if we uh, were to undraw the intervals here, right, and we would look only at the sequences of endpoints, basically we have two sequences here. This is the sequence, let's zoom out a little bit so that we can see all the elements. So the orange sequence is the sequence AN of the left endpoints of the intervals, and the uh, pink sequence is the sequence being of the right endpoints of the intervals. And so we see that the intervals are shrinking. So basically, uh, the equivalent formulation would be that whenever we have uh, this sequence of endpoints, which is um, uh, the sequence AN is monotonically increased, increasing and bn is monotonically decreasing and the distance between them uh, so bn minus an is exactly the length of the interval tends to zero then in this case uh, the both sequences will converge to the same point and they're going to have the same limit so basically this is an application of the limit arithmetic theorem and so what we need to say here is that since the sequence an is going to be monotonically increasing but of course it is bounded above by uh, by B1, right, by the first, um, by, by the largest uh, interval, it's, it's a right endpoint, right? So this orange sequence is monotonically increasing and bounded, therefore, by the monotone convergence theorem, it is convergent, and this sequence is monotonically decreasing and bounded by this, from below, by uh, the left end of the uh, first interval. So it also has to converge. And then by limit arithmetic, since the difference between them tends to zero, they converge to the same limit. This is the proof verbally of how we're going to approach this. And of course, this relies on uh, completeness because, again, to prove the monotone convergence uh, theorem, we need the axiom of completeness. So let us now see the rigorous proof. So as we said, we're going to prove, in order to prove Cantor's lemma, we're going to prove the following equivalent formulation, right? Basically, let a n and b n be two sequences of real numbers that satisfy the following conditions. Basically, the conditions are the same uh, from the previous lemma. It's just the conditions that the sequences must satisfy is that they must be the endpoints of this nested sequence of intervals. So, of course, um, each a n is smaller than a n plus one because uh, uh, the, the, this this is nested intervals. Basically, what we see here in this inequality is is that if a n uh, and b n are the endpoints of the interval i n, then the endpoints are contained of the next interval are satisfying this inequality. This means that the interval i n plus one uh, is contained in the interval i n as we have here, right? This is exactly to say that i n plus one is contained in i n. Right? And moreover, look at this sharp inequality. We are demanding that the intervals are non-degenerate. So for each n, b n plus 1 is strictly bigger than a n than plus 1. And as a result, this also means that b n is strictly bigger than a n. And another equivalent condition is to say that if the intervals are shrinking and their length or the diameter tends to zero, it means that this is the length of the interval. So, interval. so basically this limit has to be zero. Okay. But note uh, that, I mean, uh, he here is an important point. If the sequence bn minus an tends to zero, this doesn't mean that each of those sequences separately converges. It could be that we can have two divergent sequences, uh, the difference between which tends to zero. So we have to be careful. But uh, to conclude that they have exactly the same, li the same limit, we must also know that if we were to know that b n and a and both converge, then we would deduce that they converge to the same limit. So this is the essence here. So provided that those conditions are satisfied, we can say that the sequences converge to the same limit. And um, so there exists this real uh, uh, number c. This c is unique. 
and it is unique number that satisfies that it is contained in all the intervals for every natural number n. So this is Cantor's lemma, this is the formulation, and now we're going to prove it, okay? So, uh, we, we see by the assumption that the sequence an is monotonically increasing and b in bn is monotonically decreasing, again we see it here because a n is, is smaller than a n plus 1 for every n. Here, by the way, the equality is not strict. It could be that the end points of the next interval coincide with the end point of the previous um, interval, at least in, 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 some, uh, in one of the ends, right? So, a n is monotonically increasing and similarly b n is monotonically decreasing. It's also stated here because for every n, b n plus 1 is smaller than b n, right? So, those sequences are monotone, right? And moreover, we have, again, by the condition, is that a n is smaller or equal than b1, right? Because, again, if we look here at this condition, b n is monotonically decreasing, and therefore b1 is the biggest element, and uh, so b1 would be bigger than any b n, right? And as a result, b1 will be bigger than any a n, right? So a n is monotonically increasing and is bounded above, and similarly for b n, a1 is the smallest element because an is monotonically decreasing and so a1 is smaller than any an and as a result any an is smaller than, than um, any uh, bn so a1 is smaller than any bn right for every n so that's what we said so for every n we have that a n is smaller or equal to b1 and a1 is uh, smaller or equal than any bn so again, what we have here is that a n is monotonically increasing and bounded above, uh, and b n is monotonically decreasing and bounded from below. Therefore, uh, by the monotone convergence theorem, we deduce that both of those sequences converge. Yeah? And the monotone convergence theorem, again, relies on the completeness property of the real numbers. I cannot emphasize this enough, because again, if we dig deep enough, we all always encounter the completeness property of the real numbers, which is of crucial importance for analysis. All right, and now, uh, basically what we can deduce now by the limit, now we can apply the limit arithmetic theorem, because we know that a n converges to some a, and b n converges to some b. And now when we know that those limits exist, now we can apply the limit arithmetic theorem. Basically, what we know is that this limit from the assumptions of the lemma has to be zero. But on the other hand, limit arithmetic says that bn converges to b and an converges to a. So by the limit arithmetic, this limit is b minus a, right? So we may as well denote this b uh, and a by the same number. So we can say that there exists a number c such that c is this limit. c is the limit of the sequence of an, and um, a, it's also the limit of the sequence of bn's. And now it only remains to prove uniqueness, right? So let us show that cn is, is unique such point. Uh, so by uh, the monotonicity, since a, an is monotonically increasing to its limit, then forever, basically c is the supremum of this sequence an, which is bounded above, right? So any an is... A or, or a n is smaller or equal than c for every n, and c is smaller uh, or equal than b n for, for every n, right? Uh, so because c is therefore this limit point of the sequences, uh, and so what, so c n is contained in all the intervals. So all the intervals in their intersection are going to contain this point c, right? So the intersection of all the interval, intervals contains at least one point, and this point is C. We can point uh, at this point and say, well, C is common for all the intervals, right? Uh, so the intersection of all the intervals contains at least one point C, and, um, right, and, and we see it here. Since every interval contains in the sequence contains a point C, their intersection contains the point C. But maybe there's another one. And what we're going to prove that there cannot be such a point. So suppose that there is another point that is contained in all the intervals, right? And since bn minus an, right, we assume that bn is bigger than any um, of the ans, strictly bigger, then uh, bn minus an, remember, this is the diamet diameter of this interval. So it means that bn minus an is the farthest distance between any two points in the interval. And therefore, if c and c prime are any points in, 
in this interval, right, then the distance between them cannot be longer than the length of the interval. It can be at most that. So the distance between them is smaller than that. And this holds for every n, right, for every n. But we also know that the sequence converges to zero. We know that this limit exists. And so we may apply the limit arithmetic theorem and says that in the limit, uh, we have that this is, sm uh, since every element of this sequence is bigger than that, then so is the limit. But the limit is zero. And so since this limit is zero, this must be smaller or equal to zero. This implies that C equals C prime. So this point is unique. So um, another way to see this is just to say that, again, since this is smaller, um, th yeah, th this concludes the proof. But another way to see it, that the uniqueness is to say that this is smaller than that for every n, right? And since this tends to zero, this means that for every positive epsilon, we can find n of epsilon such that for every n greater than n of epsilon, this is smaller than epsilon. So basically, the difference between c and c prime is smaller than epsilon for every positive epsilon, which again implies that they must be equal. This is a standard trick in, in real analysis. So this uh, concludes the proof of Cantor's lemma. And as I mentioned, uh, Cantor's lemma can be generalized to uh, any complete metric space. So here, here the completeness is important again. Uh, we're not going to go over the proof. I'm just going to give you this, the, the spirit or the flavor of the more advanced material how this notion generalizes to metric spaces. So suppose that we have a metric space which is complete and we have those sets, a sequence of non-empty closed nested subsets. We didn't define exactly what closed means, but in essence, it's like the closed interval, but just to see the spirit of things. And the diameters of those sets, now remember that whenever we have a metric, then we have a way of measuring the assigning a diam diameter to every set. This is just the supremum of a distance um, of the distance of any two points. So basically you take uh, the set of distances, the distance between x and y for all pairs of points x, y in the set, and you just take uh, the supremum of, of this set. And this would be the diameter of, of the set C. And so if the diameters of those sets tends to zero, then the intersection of all those um, sets contains exactly one point. So again, this is super important. This is just a generalization of Cantor's lemma to arbitrary metric spaces.